Okay. Okay. Welcome everyone to HO Colloquium. Our today's speaker is Ed Thiemann from um, um, CU. Um, last, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ed Thiemann. Dr. Ed Thiemann uh, is a research scientist at NASA focusing on extreme ultraviolet instrumentation for solar irradiance and solar occultations. His PhD work focused on solar irradiance modeling using the extreme ultraviolet monitor on board the MAVEN mission, which has been studying masses, upper atmosphere, and space environment since 2014. After defending his PhD in 2016, his research began to focus on using the solar extreme ultraviolet spectrum to probe planetary upper atmosphere, and he has created new data sets of thermospheric density at Earth and Mars using solar EUV photometers. Currently, he is developing additional data sets of Earth, Earth's thermosphere and uh, exosphere using instrumentation intended for studying the sun and instrumentation for the next generation of upper atmosphere measurements. His current NASA flight instrument responsibilities include being the PI of the occultation wave link sounder owls instrument and the deputy PI of the MAVEN UV monitor. To um, aid, and we will be speaking today on ultraviolet occultations and essential technique for bridging the thermospheric gap. All right. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for uh, joining here in the room as well as online. Um, so uh, as the title gives away, I'll be talking about ultraviolet uh, occultations and really solar occultations in particular. And and um, and uh, that's why I, I, I want I like kicking it off with this figure here. Uh, this is. Uh, sun sunrise as viewed from the ISS, and um, you could imagine that if uh, you had an instrument on board the ISS at this time, you could actually use that sunlight to uh, to probe the uh, uh, probe the uh, upper atmosphere. So it it really gives you a visual for the um, for the for the measurement I'll be talking about. Um, so. Uh, while uh, I, I know it's always good to, to, to flatter the, the home audience, I've, I've given a version of this talk uh, probably four times, and I have, I promise, always kicked it off with this figure here uh, that came out of uh, uh, HAO from uh, Solomon and Chen's 2005 paper showing the uh, EUV energy deposition in the upper atmosphere. I mean, I think it's a fantastic figure. Uh, it shows uh, 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 EUV absorption as a function of altitude and, uh, and wavelength. Um, really gives you a visual of the altitude ranges covered. So, you know, anywhere between 100 and uh, and, and 400 kilometers. Um, and uh, these EUV photons, um, as we know, are what uh, creates the ionosphere. Uh, it's what heats the thermosphere. Uh, it's the primary energy input uh, to the Earth's upper atmosphere. And, you know, it's really, you know, uh, fundamentally important. But we can also just look at this figure and think about Using EUV irradiance as a tool, and I think this this figure here hi highlights that the that the EUV band is is really optimal for uh, probing uh, the thermosphere uh, using uh, using solar occultations. Um, so when we're uh, doing a solar occultation from uh, from a spacecraft, we're we're probing uh, we're probing the atmosphere as that spacecraft uh, enters eclipse or as it uh, exits eclipse. Uh, and uh, and we're using sunlight. And so if that sunlight is absorbed in the atmosphere, uh, that absorption is is concentrated around this uh, around this tangent, uh, the tangent point, the point where the line of sight is is tangent to the to the limb of the earth. And we can um, uh, uh, make measurements as a function of of tangent altitude, that height here right at the right at the tangent point. Um, and so if you're using um, uh, a wavelength uh, that is absorbed in the atmosphere, the the, the transmitted, a uh, portion will, of course, be less bright than the uh, than the incident portion, and you can use this simple relationship, the the Beer-Lambert absorption law, uh, to relate the uh, the incident light I naught to the uh, uh, to the transmitted uh, light. Um, and if you take the ratio of the transmitted light to the incident light, you get this 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 term called the extinction ratio, and this is really the fundamental occultation uh, measurement. Uh, this is real data from uh, the LIRA instrument, the dates here at the top of the figure, um, and it's uh, uh, absorption of 10 to 20 nanometer light 
uh, in Earth's thermosphere, uh, spanning from about 150 to uh, 300 uh, kilometers. So I think there's a, a you know a couple of things we can take away from from this figure alone. One, I want to point out that it's that it's unitless. It just varies from uh, zero to one, and so that tells us that uh, with an uh, occultation me measurement, it's essentially self-calibrating. It doesn't depend on any uh, absolute calibration uh, of the instrument. Now, of course, it depends on the instrument linearity, and so you have to make sure your your measurement is linear over this uh, this dynamic range. But there is no uh, absolute calibration term, even though you are me using it to measure uh, a fundamental parameter, and that is um, uh, the, the the column density or capital N uh, in this uh, in this figure or in this equation here. Um, uh, another thing I want to point out is that um, this is this is a real measurement, and so for those of us who have looked at atmospheric limb uh, observations, I think we might agree that there is very little uh, noise in this signal here. And that's because the sun, of course, is very bright. There's a lot of photons, and you get an extremely high uh, signal-to-noise uh, ratio. Um, and so, uh, essentially, if you have this um, extinction ratio measurement, and you know the atmospheric absorption cross-section, or sigma, uh, 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 sigma i in this uh, equation, you can calculate the, uh, the column density, or the, the column of absorbers along the line of sight. Um, OK, and so now, you know, this. Uh, Extinction ratio, it, it contains a, a lot of information uh, from it. Um, knowing the column density, we can calculate, or knowing the atmospheric cross section, we can calculate the column density uh, essentially just by taking the natural log of the, uh, of the uh, extinction ratio. This is really a calculation you could do by hand. And so here in the, in the middle of the plot is a, a plot of the corresponding uh, uh, column density. But what you know we're really interested in as uh, as, atm as atmospheric uh, physicists are is you know typically number density, and so the the number density is related to the column density as the uh, as the integral as the line of sight integral um, uh, uh, of, of of the measurement. And so this is a little bit trickier to solve, but there's uh, standard approaches. Um, one being the uh, the Abel transform that you can um, more or less straightforwardly apply to your uh, 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 column density profile to calculate a number density profile like that shown here on the right. Now, another thing that uh, we, we like to know about is what the uh, thermospheric temperature is. And so uh, in, in this uh, set of panels, I, I, I walked through the uh, thermospheric temperature equation. Uh, these uh, measurements are actually at, uh, for Mars's thermosphere. So the temperatures might be a little bit uh, uh, different than what you're used to. But just to get you oriented, at Mars, the, the mesopause is around 100 kilometers. The exobase is around 180 uh, uh, kilometers. Um, so to, to calculate uh, temperature from density, first you want to generate a pressure profile. And you do that by uh, vertically integrating your density profile at each point. So you're basically just calculating the amount of stuff that's above you. That's essentially the definition of, of pressure. And uh, given a, um, a pressure profile and a, a, number, uh, a number density profile, you can use the ideal gas law to, um, to, calculate, the, uh, the, uh, to calculate a temperature profile. Um, so uh, I, think, I think I used the term thermospheric gap in, in the title of my, uh, of my talk, so I should, I should probably go ahead and, and define that. I think, I think this, this term first appeared in the lit literature in a 2010, 2011-ish paper uh, by Jens Overheide, and uh, uh, where he was lamenting the fact that there's all these interesting dynam dynamics that are occurring between 130 and 250 kilometers, um, but we don't really have that many uh, 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 observations that have a high enough uh, signal to noise to uh, detect these uh, phenomena. And in particular, we don't have enough vertically resolved uh, observations uh, across the uh, thermosphere gap. Um, and so this schematic here highlights um, uh, the, the, the many interesting processes that are occurring in the, in the middle thermosphere, um, in particular those related to um, processes at the, at the surface. So you can have um, uh, interactions between wind and top topography generating gravity waves. Uh, you can have convection over uh, uh, storms generating gravity waves. You have uh, thermal tides. Uh, these can uh, interact with each other. Um, and uh, and 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 some can can propagate upward, um, uh, either um, breaking at the mesopause, generating uh, additional waves, and propagating uh, past the the me mesopause into the uh, middle thermosphere, where you have uh, you know at high latitudes, uh, concentration of dual heating, um, 
you've got uh, uh, various plasma processes, really just a lot of interesting physics happening here, but, uh, but not that many vertically resolved uh, measurements uh, of the neutrals in particular to, to help us understand what's, what's really going on. And so, um, and so uh, this here is a, a, a chart showing the, I think the major, I probably left off a few. I think I, I know I need to add icon. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I think these are the major, uh, some of the major measurements since the 70s of the, of the thermosphere, the big data sets that, that we uh, often uh, use. Um, so in uh, the, the 70s and, and early 80s, we had atmospheric explorer and dynamics explorer um, having these, these highly elliptical orbits where they could actually fly mass, mass spectrometers through the thermosphere and, and measure densities in situ uh, at, you know, really low uh, altitudes. When you think about it, you know, atmospheric explorer was, was going down to 130 kilometers at one point, you know, measuring the atmosphere in situ, um, yet it had a high enough ap uh, apoapsis that was uh, able to, to maintain its, its orbit, not completely re-enter. Um, you know, these observations here, I think, went into the IMPSIS data set um, for uh, uh, neutral uh, density and, and, and co uh, composition formed a, 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 uh, much of the uh, IMPSIS data set. Uh, but then for uh, 20 years or so, there weren't really any uh, additional um, uh, measurements until uh, timed came along. And, uh, and the timed uh, GUVI uh, instrument, while it's still operating today for its first uh, you know, six or so years, was able to make limb scans. And so that would uh, provide uh, vertically resolved measurements um, of, uh, of the thermosphere while the um, uh, 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 limb scanning mechanism was, was operating. There's also uh, Champ and Grace and and uh, and Goche making um, in, in situ measurements using accelerometers, of total total mass density, and this was really at one fixed altitude. But then, as those spacecraft, uh, as their orbits uh, decayed, they were able to sample lower and lower until they uh, effectively uh, re-entered. And then, more re recently, we've got uh, we've got Gold, um, but Gold you know, right here, as I'm showing, is its, it's primary measurement is is Nader, so it's not really giving us uh, 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 vertical information, you know, uh, measurements that are, that are concentrated at a, at, a, at a single altitude. And so, you know, I'm sorry if I left your major data set out, um, but I think in general, this is that thermosphere gap that um, that uh, Jens Oberheide was talking about and that, that others have, have talked about um, as well. Um, and this is the data record without occultations. Um, now I've added, uh, the planned occultations, the instruments that were planned to measure the thermosphere using occultations. And if you if you didn't look fast enough, you'll see that you may have missed that this box here showed up around gold, and this is gold stellar occultations of uh, O2 uh, density. Um, but more or less, that's kind of it for planned occultations of the of the thermosphere. But wait, there's more. There was actually uh, a plethora of serendipitous occultations that have that have gone across the thermosphere gap and um, ex, you know extended our knowledge of the uh, of, of the thermosphere. Um, these are instruments. These are measurements from instruments that were intended to, to measure the sun, such as uh, SS uh, SMM and UR SUS, uh, SUSM, which um, were able to measure O2 density with occultations. And then uh, more recently, the uh, SUVI instrument on GOES and uh, the uh, LIRA instrument on, on PROBA2 could make um, solar occultations uh, across the thermosphere of, of O and N2. Um, and you'll notice that the SUVI measurements are, are striped uh, in, this, in this, and this isn't just for a visual effect. Does anybody have an idea of what might cause the, the striping in this data record here of, of SUVI and LIRA? So if I were to say that for an eclipse, for a for an occultation, you have to have an eclipse, and it turns out these are solar instruments. And if you want to study the sun, you typically want to avoid eclipses. And so, uh, and so these uh, solar uh, 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 measurements or, or these missions in general had uh, relatively narrow eclipse seasons, and so you could only get the occultation during the eclipse season. So there's a, a discontinuity throughout the year in these uh, in these data sets. Um, and so, uh, and so now I'm going to uh, dig into some of these measurements, into the LIRA measurement and the, and the SUVI measurements, and, and 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 show some data from these uh, from these mission missions. I'll, I'll start with LIRA. Uh, I want to um, uh, start by pointing out that that LIRA is an ex extremely simple uh, instrument. It's a it's a 
photometer. So it basically has a photodiode and a transmission filter. Uh, and I mean, that's the primary optics. And then you've got some baffles and, and an aperture, but it's, 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 it's a very simple measurement. Um, and it has one channel that uses a zirconium foil filter uh, that isolates the band between 10 and 20 nanometers. And um, it turns out that this band is actually suitable uh, to me for measuring uh, total number density, really just due to, to you know, a luck of nature. Uh, as it turns out, uh, the, um, uh, if, you, if you take the uh, absorption cross-sections of O and N2 and weight them by the solar spe spectrum between uh, 10 and 20 nanometers, the effective absorption cross-section of O and N2 are about the same. And so while you can't distinguish O from N2, the fact that they both absorb sunlight at about the same, uh, at about the same way uh, allows you to, to make a measurement of the total number density or the sum of O and N2. Um, now, LIRO was um, made to, to uh, measure the sun, so it's measuring full disk irradiance, and uh, that uh, does present somewhat of a problem because uh, in LEO, the solar disk um, spans about 30, 25 to 30 kilometers at the limb. That's close to a scale height, uh, and so you really need to do something to um, uh, account for the spatially extended sun uh, um, uh, to, to improve your vertical resolution. Uh, luckily, uh, 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 Robel and Norton figured this out in the, uh, in the early uh, 70s, where they developed a, an approach where essentially you uh, forward model the extinction of the solar disk through a set of uh, isothermal reference atmospheres um, uh, to, to model the extinction. And you can adjust the temperature of those isothermal reference atmospheres uh, and iterate the approach until you're uh, measured uh, thermospheric um, uh, temperature uh, matches what you used in the assumed uh, uh, isothermal profiles. Now, we made an improvement on the Robel and Norton approach using modern uh, EUV images. Uh, and, and this accounts for the fact that um, the EUV radiance is uh, very uh, inhomogeneous over the solar disk. It's, it's concentrated in active regions. Um, and so you need to properly account for that um, uh, to, uh, to get an accurate retrieval. And so uh, in this approach, we're taking EUV images, uh, using EUV images in the in the forward model of the uh, observed uh, extinction to account uh, account for for where the uh, solar signal is is actually coming from. Um, so here's a, a um, uh, example of some of the uh, LIAR observations. These are uh, uh, measurements taken over a solar cycle, so going from 2010 to, to 2017. Um, the top row are measurements at dawn, the, the bottom row are measurements at dusk, and each column is a, is a different, uh, different altitude. Uh, red are the actual uh, LIRA measurements, uh, and, and here I'm showing uh, temperatures, and uh, blue are the corresponding IMSIS uh, uh, temperatures. And if you look at, at dawn, you can see that uh, over this, uh, this is the last solar cycle, over the last solar cycle, there's relatively good agreement between uh, LIRA and IMSIS, uh, suggesting that IMSIS is doing a, a, a good job of, of predicting average uh, dawn uh, conditions. But interestingly, you know, if we look at dusk, we see something very different. We see that um, uh, at the middle and, and, and higher altitudes, uh, uh, IMSIS uh, disagrees with the observations and the, and the disagreement uh, becomes larger at uh, higher solar activity. So in effect, uh, IMSIS is predicting that the thermosphere will, will warm more at dusk than what we're actually seeing uh, in, the, in the measurements. Now, uh, we, we haven't found an expl uh, explanation for, uh, for this effect uh, and, and have it on our to-do list to really um, uh, 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 dig into to this some more. Um, I, my guess is it's not showing up in IMSIS because IMSIS is an empirical model and the uh, dawn terminator was relatively sparsely sampled. And so there's um, a very likely going to be steep gradients across the terminator that are just getting smoothed over in, uh, in, in MSIS. Um, okay, so um, does anybody know what this is a, a, a figure of, a photo of, it's a photograph from the surface? Yes, that's right. Yeah, this is the, uh, the, the Starlink storm. Um, and uh, if you go online, uh, you can find this video. I think it was taken from Puerto, Puerto Rico. There's like a time-lapse video that shows the spacecraft re-enter over... Um, uh, a couple orbits, um, but yeah. So the the SpaceX uh, Starlink storm was in February of uh, 2022. Uh, 49 uh, spacecraft were were, were lost. 
Uh, the explanation for this was they were in these relatively low parking orbits at 209 kilometers when a, when a moderate uh, CME uh, impacted Earth. And, and this event got a lot of, a lot of press. And um, there was actually also a number of, of serious uh, scientific articles that, that came out um, about this. Um, and so uh, Lyra was making measurements during the uh, Starlink storm, uh, measuring uh, neutral density profiles from 150 to uh, 350 kilometers every, every 100 minutes. Uh, and as far as I know, these are the, uh, the only vertical density profiles of, uh, of this event. Um, and so here I'm, I'm, I'm showing um, uh, time series at four different altitude, altitudes. At the top, it's 200 kilometers, and then uh, the very lowest one is 330 kilometers. And then on the left are measurements at dawn, the right are measurements at dusk. Um, and then in pink, I'm showing the uh, the DST index to, to show you the progression of the storm. Uh, and this Starlink storm was this two peaked uh, DST feature here in the in, in the middle of the of the plot. And you can see that those two peaks in DST correspond with these two enhancements in, in neutral density. Um, neutral densities uh, was enhanced by about a factor of, of two at 330 kilometers, much less near the 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 uh, SpaceX. Um, uh, uh, parking orbit, but still the the increase was uh, about uh, about uh, fifty percent. Um, all right, and so uh, I'm going to change gears now and, and talk about um, doing occultations with the with the SUV imager, um, uh, and uh, and really using those occultations to uh, come up with a uh, a data product that uh, we can incorporate into the uh, into the existing uh, uh, SUV space weather operation. Uh, uh, pipeline. Um, so this work was funded by a NASA um, ODAR uh, ODAR grant, um, and uh, and use SUVI, which is typically used to uh, um, understand, characterize, and predict the morphology on the on the on the sun itself. But use SUVI to to probe the uh, the, the upper atmosphere. And um, we uh, at the end by the end of this grant ended up getting the pipeline running on the uh, in the NCI servers, and so this data is. Is available through the uh, through the NCI uh, website. Uh, unfortunately, it's not yet at operational latency. It's uh, it's they're, they're basically at the latency of the the, the 24 hour the, the daily uh, data product. So um, it's not uh, not uh, operational uh, yet. Um, but you know to show how we um, make make those observations. So again, we're relying on this 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 fundamental uh, measurement called the extinction ratio. But since we have an imager, we're actually dealing with uh, extinction ratio images. So we, um, so this image here at the at the top left is showing the sun, the EUV sun set uh, set in the thermosphere. That shadow that you see is the thermosphere itself absorbing those uh, EUV photons. And so we can take this um, occulted image and uh, divide that image by an image uh, that was not occulted, measured near in time, and generate this uh, extinction uh, ratio image um, for space weather uh, uh, operations we're really just interested in the the vertical the vertical profile and so we do a horizontal average and, and collapse this image you see in the center into the profile you see there uh, on the on the right um, now uh, SUVI is nice because it, it's it's making measurements at a number of EUV bands and so we have enough measurements to fully constrain uh, thermospheric composition and, and we can um, measure both O and N2. Uh, and so here's an example of, of, of the uh, SUV uh, uh, data record. Um, this is going from uh, 2018 through uh, 2024. Uh, blue are uh, atomic O, uh, orange is uh, molecular uh, nitrogen, and then green is showing the uh, F10.7 radio flux. Um, you know, nothing uh, at, at this high level, nothing you know, super surprising here. We're seeing thermospheric expansion over the course of a uh, over a, a solar cycle. This figure on the right is showing an example of a geomagnetic storm that uh, occurred in March uh, 2023. So um, SUVI is on the GOES spacecraft. That's an uh, an opera. Uh, it's on an operational constellation. So there's um, always two uh, making measurements at, at any given time. And so uh, and so here we're showing um, uh, measurements of uh, both. Uh, uh, measurements of total mass density uh, from both uh, SUVI spacecraft during this geomagnetic storm, and these are at dawn at 250 uh, kilometers. Um, 
And then the DST index there is in orange. And so you can see as the DST index drops, the uh, uh, thermospheric density uh, increases. Um, I would point out, even though these plots are just showing uh, densities at uh, 250 uh, kilometers, SUBI pro uh, produces profiles. So we actually have, for each one of these data points, we have a, an atmospheric profile from uh, about 180 kilometers to 350 kilometers. Um, and so some bonus science with SUVI uh, was um, being able to detect uh, gravity waves and actually make uh, images at extremely high altitude of, of gravity waves. Um, and so uh, we had thought we would be able to find gravity waves in our data, uh, but it took quite a bit of searching to actually find uh, an example. And, and the example we found, we've actually found a few examples now, um, but the first example we found um, were waves that were uh, excited or occurred for about three days uh, during a high-speed wind stream driven uh, disturbed geomagnetic, I don't even want to call it geomagnetic storm, there's disturbed geomagnetic uh, conditions associated with the high-speed solar wind stream. And we found that when the, uh, you know, the KP index went uh, above four, uh, we, we saw these, uh, these waves at, uh, at high uh, latitudes. Um, and so here's uh, an, an example, uh, an example image um, showing the, the waves as a function of, of altitude and, and latitude. And we see it, you know, extending from a, the, the bottom of our observation at 180 kilometers up to uh, 280 uh, uh, kilometers. And so we, we believe these are uh, aurorally uh, generated. We're, we're making uh, measurements near the auroral zone. We've got, you know, disturbed geomagnetic uh, activity. When we're looking in the same place without disturbed geomagnetic activity, we're not seeing these waves. Um, so uh, that's the uh, the thinking on the uh, the origin of these waves uh, at this point. Um, what's great about uh, vertical gravity wave images is you can actually calculate um, uh, uh, very um, important physical parameters like uh, energy density and, and momentum flux um, because you can calculate the brunt basala frequency, which has this dt, dz term. So you need to have a vertical temperature profile. Um, and if you have the, the brunt basala frequency as a function of, of altitude, and you have the density variance uh, as a function of altitude, you can uh, calculate the uh, potential uh, energy density. And so here on the left is an, an image of the potential energy density in the, in the range that this wave is propagating. Now I've put this red box on the data now, and that's to, to, to block out noisy data. And, and the reason I'm doing that is this um, potential energy density depends on this variance term, basically the, you know, the, the, the waviness the variability of the density. And if you have noise in your measurement, that's going to cause that term to, to, to blow up. And um, if your you know, variability is coming from noise and not waves, it's, it's, it's an artifact. Um, so that, that's why there's this, this red region on the data. Um, but we can use these calculations to see if the, if the wave is, is dissipating energy. And so on this plot on the right, this is a, a vertical slice through that image. The dashed curve is showing you what the potential energy density should be as a function of altitude if the wave was conserving its its energy. So if it wasn't dissipating energy, and then the the, the black curve is is the data itself, and we see that uh, it looks it it um it seems to be uh, conserving its uh, its energy. Uh, one other way to look at this, we don't know if the wave is propagating up or down. It, it is possible that it was a, a downward propagating wave. Some of that energy is actually being dissipated below uh, 200 kilometers. Um, all right, so um, that was uh, wave analysis uh, using solar occultation data at Earth. Um, this same approach has been done uh, at, at Mars uh, using instruments that were actually designed for solar occultations on the trace gas orbiter. Uh, this is from a paper by Sarachenko, Sarachenko and colleagues uh, published in 2021, um, uh, where she uh, calculates the um, gravity wave potential energy uh, as well as the uh, momentum flux from um, uh, wave observations and, and temperature profiles. And so I, I, I really want to um, highlight these observations here in, in the left panel. So this is a temperature profile from a single instrument going from near the surface, so around 10 kilometers, Remember, the mesopause at Mars is around 120 kilometers, so to the mesopause, and 180 kilometers is the exobase. And this is a like single instrument, single measurement. You have this, this wave pro profile uh, you know, going across Mars's version of the, uh, of the thermosphere gap. Um, so um, uh, they basically used the same approach that I showed in the previous slide, 
uh, to calculate the gravity wave potential. Energy density, that is shown here in this, in this middle plot. And, um, and, you know, essentially you can see the potential energy density grows around 80 kilometers. Um, there, is, there is this apparent dip. But then um, I think what's notable is that once you get to mesopause altitudes, you see a rapid fall off in that potential energy uh, density, uh, seeming to suggest that, that this particular wave uh, was uh, either breaking or, or dissipating um, uh, at, in the mesopause or, or, or just above the mesopause. Um, they also go ahead and calculate gravity wave momentum flux uh, with a single vertical profile. You have to make some assumptions. Mainly, you have to uh, assume what the uh, what the uh, horizontal wavelength is. They don't have any horizontal information in this measurement, but they make an assumption and then come up with a momentum flux calculation. I would point out, we've done the same approach. I'm not showing it here for the SUVI images. And here we have both horizontal and vertical information. So here we can fully constrain, except for the direction, the, uh, the momentum flux of this particular wave. Um, okay, so uh, now I'm gonna, take us back to Earth, but look at the extremely high upper atmosphere, so the, the geocorona, uh, and, and show some measurements we have the of the geocorona using another instrument on GOES. So um, the, the geocorona, it's the top of the atmosphere. Um, it, it, you know, it, it extends beyond the moon. Um, the coronal density it's, it has important implications for planetary uh, evolution, atmospheric escape. Uh, as well as geomagnetic storm dynamics. Um, it's the reservoir that fills the, uh, the, the plasma sphere. Uh, collisions with neutrals, uh, ion neutral collisions uh, affect the ring current decay. Um, so being able to, to constrain uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the geocorona and its, its density has, has uh, in, uh, important uh, implications beyond just uh, the, the corona itself. So uh, prior measurements of uh, hydrogen uh, measure uh, air glow, so it's measuring resonantly scattered uh, solar photons. And some examples are shown here on the left. The orange, uh, the orange color on the left is from a hydrogen measured by uh, DE. And then on the right, this is uh, actually um, the geocorona is seen from the moon from the Apollo 16 measurement. And so all that white is this white cloud of hydrogen that is enveloping uh, the Earth. And this picture here on the right shows the, the, the difficulties of interpreting uh, air glow measurements when trying to understand the corona, especially the energy of corona. It's clearly optically thick. It's this cloud of hydrogen. You, you, it, you can't really infer a density because you, 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 you know, you, you kind of lose, you, you, you lose optical information as it becomes uh, optically thick. However, uh, solar occultations, as I'm gonna show in the next couple of slides of Lyme and Alpha, they're insensitive to this high opacity. So they provide us an opportunity to probe the, uh, the, uh, the uh, energy of corona where uh, to do so using uh, air glow measurements, you have to use relatively complicated uh, radiative transfer. Um, and so the, uh, the instrument we're using, uh, it's, it's on GOES, just like SUVI. In fact, if you look here, it sits next to SUVI. It's the, uh, the EXIS instrument. Um, uh, it flies a sensor called uh, EUVS, uh, or has a sensor called EUVS, um, it's actually the second generation of the EUVS sensor. There was a, a another uh, EUVS on earlier GOES, but the one we're using here has been on the GOES instruments that started flying in 2016, and we expect to have uh, into the into the mid 2030s. Uh, it's a, a relatively coarse spectral measurement uh, at 0 0.6 uh, nanometer resolution, um, but we see geocoronal uh, absorption every orbit, and then during the uh, eclipse seasons. Around the equinoxes, we you know, can see uh, extinction of the signal uh, down to the uh, down to the exobase. Um, and so, uh, the the reason we can get around opacity issues that uh, make the air glow interpreting the air glow measurements difficult is that uh, the absorption of the solar Lyman alpha line continues all the way through the geocorona. It's just the absorption shifts out to the wings of the measurement. And so, um, I'll just illustrate that here with these these two figures. On the right, I'm showing an actual uh, measurement, uh, an occultation measurement of from, from uh, GOES EUVS. And on the left, I'm, I'm showing a, a model of the corresponding uh, absorption. And so if we look at this top point here where the, the signal is about 1% absorbed, um, it corresponds with the, the highest dip you see here. 
And I guess I should take a step back here on the left plot you're see, seeing the solar Lyman alpha emission line is this very broad feature with the two humps. And then right in the middle of it, you're looking at the, uh, the hydrogen absorption feature. And so at 1% at absorption, you're, you're seeing this, this middle absorption feature. And then if we jump down to 4% of uh, absorption, we see this, this lowest uh, absorption feature. And you can see that it does, it does as you go lower into the, um, as the line of sight goes lower into the, uh, uh, into the atmosphere, the uh, absorption does get deeper, but more importantly, it gets broader. And so if you uh, if you if you have no more photons left at line center, which would be the case in the optically thick case, you still have uh, absorption occurring at the wings. And so you get a nice continuous uh, absorption um, uh, absorption profile in the measurement. Of course, this also means that the absorption line shape is crucial for deriving the density. And and uh, 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 and especially knowing what the what the um, uh, what the cross sec what the wings of the cross section look like, um, and so that's I think really the the hard part in this uh, in this measurement. So um, so each line of sight is going to have a unique cross section because each line of sight is looking at a different velocity distribution of 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 hydrogen along that line of sight, um, and uh, and it turns out that that velocity distribution uh, changes with altitude. Uh, the velocity distribution is going to be Maxwellian near the exo base, but it's going to get narrow as you go higher up. And we can see that with uh, this figure here on the right. Uh, blue is the uh, uh, velocity distribution near the exo base of, of hydrogen. It's, it's very Maxwellian. But if you go up to 40,000 uh, kilometers, as shown in black, it gets uh, much more narrow. And, and the reason for that is, is you've, you've essentially traded some of that thermal energy for gravitational potential energy, these... these um, uh, atoms have really slowed down, and that's affecting the absorption cross-section. And so to handle this, we use a, a Monte Carlo uh, 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 model of the exosphere to calculate the velocity distribution of, um, of hydrogen along each, uh, of each, along each line of sight for a given uh, exobase temperature and, uh, and, um, and density. Um, and, and then we have a, a library of different cases that we use in our, in our retrieval that we iterate through. Um, and so here's uh, just, you know, uh, cutting to the chase and, and showing some of our observations. Uh, these are, um, this is a pretty new analysis uh, looking at solar cycle variability of, uh, of the Gia Corona um, and analyzing data from the, the present day back to, uh, back to 2019. Um, so uh, looking at the, the figure here on the left, um, I really want you just to focus on the, uh, the 2023 and the 2024 measurements. Those are blue and pink. Those are the two lines that are standing out from the rest. And so really, this is um, we're looking at spring, so early in the year. That's when we really approach solar maximum conditions. Uh, and we do see an enhancement. Um, if we look at the solar minimum observations, we really don't see much enhancement at all. These, I, I should also say, are about an average of six weeks of data around each spring. And so I think it's remarkably notable that the Gia Corona is, is very stable over uh, solar minimum. And as we approach solar maximum, it, it really doesn't uh, change by much. The enhancement here might, yeah, it's about 10%. It's, it's not very significant. Now, this isn't surprising. The, the classical picture of the Gia Corona uh, holds that it's source limited. So as we, um, as solar activity increases, the exo base temperature increases, the atmosphere wants to expand, but it can only expand by the amount of uh, uh, hydrogen available at the exobase. And if you're not getting hydrogen into the, uh, through the lower atmosphere into the exobase, you're not going to be able to inflate your uh, corona. And so this was kind of the picture that people um, understood for about 25 or 30 years. And then in 2015, uh, uh, measurements from, uh, uh, air glow measurements from the, the twin spacecraft um, showed that uh, during, uh, from solar minimum to solar maximum, there was this uh, significant increase and uh, in, in, uh, the geocoronal density. Um, Goes seems to suggest that this isn't really the case and that the, that the, classical, uh, that, that the classical picture is, is, uh, is actually still uh, holding for the, for the geocorona. Um, so uh, now I'm gonna, uh, I guess the last instrument I'm gonna talk about is the occultation wave limb sounder. This is gonna be the first instrument that's intended to make EUV solar occultations of the, of the thermosphere. Um, it's gonna be a two-year mission, expect to launch in uh, mid 2026. Uh, it's, 
uh, coming out of LASP, I'm, I'm the PI, uh, Katie Greer is the deputy PI, and then there's uh, scientists from both LASP and Space Weather Trek and, and, and Virginia Tech on, on the project. Um, uh, it, it consists of, uh, of two instruments, one called EUV Op and uh, another called uh, CSOL. Uh, CSOL is an imaging spectrograph for um, measuring gravity wave perturbations and EUV Op is a photometer instrument for, for measuring uh, thermospheric density. And uh, we plan uh, to launch on the uh, on, uh, with with Loft as a as a hosted payload uh, on their on their Longbow uh, spacecraft. Um, so the science is, uh, um, I think, fairly straightforward. Uh, there's a, a general consist consensus that gravity waves have a significant influence on thermospheric structure and general circulation, but the direct influence on temperature is up for debate. Um, there's you know different models showing very different results. And this is, you know, direct heating or cooling by, by gravity wave dissipation. This uh, figure on the right is from a paper by Yigit and Medjeda published in 2009, and they're showing direct heating and co cooling can have uh, impacts of 120, 180 degrees near the poles. Um, you know, similar analysis by uh, Vadas and colleagues uh, looking at the direct thermal impact showing temperature differences of about six degrees. So a huge disparity in the models, but you know, not really data sets out there to uh, to constrain uh, either conclusion. So OWLS is going to perform a simple experiment by simultaneously measuring gravity wave energy density in the lower thermosphere and comparing it to temperature in the uh, in the upper atmosphere in, in the upper thermosphere. And um, here's a, a, a spaghetti chart chasing uh, tracing the the measurements. Um, so so CSOL is is our our, our uh, gravity wave instrument measuring gravity waves between 100 and, and 200 kilometers, um, looking for uh, pertub perturbations in, in the vertical uh, uh, density uh, profile. We can use this to calculate the gravity wave potential energy using um, the equations I showed earlier in the talk. EUV op is our um, our thermosphere temperature sensor, so it's going to measure temperature in the in the middle and upper thermosphere from 150 to 300 kilometers, um, uh, basically deriving a temperature profile. And so with those two uh, measurements, we can relate uh, the change in, in thermospheric temperature at high altitudes to the gravity wave uh, potential energy density at, at lower thermospheric uh, uh, altitudes. Um, all right, and so um, before wrapping up, I, I, I wanna talk about the, the legacy of solar occultations in the, in the lower atmosphere. And so, so while, while OWLS is the first dedicated solar occultation instrument for the thermosphere, um, they're, they're, Solar occultations are routinely used for the, the lower atmosphere. Uh, notable examples are, are SAGE 1 through 3, POEM 1 through 3, ACE FPS, SOFI, and that's, I guess, getting into the upper atmosphere up to 100 kilometers. And so Earth scientists have leveraged the advantages of the solar occultations for, uh, for decades. That's the extremely high signal to noise ratio that you can use to detect faint signals like trace gases, winds, and waves. And that it's a, a self calibrating measurement. So this is ideal for detecting small or long term variations. And so, you know, the, the case I'm, I, I want to make with this uh, in, in conclusion is what's preventing the upper atmosphere community from uh, following suit. And so, in my, you know, this is my last slide. I just want to, you know, tie some of the observations to uh, the last decadal survey. We don't have the new decadal survey yet, but, you know, how, how can occultations advance these goals? Um, looking at the, the first goal on the left, how does the IT system respond to and regulate magnetosphere, magnetospheric forcing over global, regional, and local scales? Well, the, the LIRA observations of the uh, Starlink storm showing that we can get vertical density profiles uh, during, uh, during storm time could, uh, could address that. Um, how does the lower atmosphere variability affect geospace? Um, I think uh, OWL's uh, the OWL's gravity wave mission will, will address this directly. We also, you know, have uh, we can see what we have in store based on the the, the measurements from uh, from Mars on the on, on the TGO spacecraft. Um, the next two uh, uh, goals um, are looking at the at the at, at geospace. So, how do high latitude electromagnetic energy and particle flows impact geospace? What are the origins of plasma and neutral populations within geospace? And then, you know, how do neutrals and plasmas interact to produce multi uh, multi-scale structures in the AIM system. Well, to, to fully understand this problem, you need to you need to know what the what that neutral reservoir is doing. So having measurements of the um, uh, of hydrogen throughout the inner corona that spans the Van Allen belts um, would 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 help address this. Uh, and then the last uh, question, 
you know, how is our planetary environment changing over multi-decadal scales? Well, hopefully in 2037, we'll, we'll have um, uh, 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 an over 20 year uh, data record from, from SUVI, a self-calibrated data record of uh, composition, temperature, and, and density to help us uh, understand, um, uh, address this problem. And then from the space uh, weather standpoint, obviously there's some, some goals related to space weather. Um, you know, SUVI uh, is an operational spacecraft. If we can get its, its uh, measurements into the operational pipeline, then um, that should advance uh, that goal as well. So um, I'll leave it there. I will uh, thank you all for your attention. And if I have time, I'll take some questions. Thank you. Questions? And also online, yeah. And uh, in an uh, earlier figure, you showed you saw gravity waves around the uh, aurora. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm reading correctly. It seems the horizontal scale is one to two degrees. Uh, that or that or yes, actually or longitude, right? Right. And uh, and the vertical, so it's about one to two hundred kilometer horizontal scale. Yeah. And uh, almost a hundred in the vertical, right? Right. Right. So usually with this instrument, what kind of uh, wave you are sensitive to? I mean, this is the you know the scale you are measuring, but that's right. What's the range of scale you can measure? Um. So um. We have a vertical resolution of uh, about a kilometer, oh, okay. but gravity waves in the thermosphere are going to have a much larger um, vertical wave, right? Uh, uh, on the order of hundreds of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers, and so I think we're really limited by the amount of what by, we're not limited. Our instrument isn't limited, limiting the waves we can detect necessarily. It's more um, what waves can actually reach the the thermosphere, and it's it's the the large scale waves. So. Uh, apart from this, you know, the Aurora case, do you see other, you know, more quiet types? Do you see waves? N no. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I think we, we've got three detections and they're in the auroral zone uh -huh. um, and ne during uh, disturbed times. Oh. So, uh, so uh, at, you know, so I guess above 200 kilometers, we, we, we haven't okay. come. You know, we, we haven't done a super quantitative inspection of the data really we're looking for waves that we can see by eye mm. there may be fainter signals that we can uh that we could pull out but so we'll all have a uh you know more sensitive uh, or higher accuracy to for detecting waves y yes uh well owls will be uh looking lower where we expect there to be uh more waves and in particular um as you go lower in the thermosphere the vertical wavelength becomes um shorter mm -hmm. And so that that I think enables more waves to appear in your in your in your field of view. And so um, I gave an example of what we hope to see from owls. So this is actually from a, a UV stellar occultation through Earth's thermosphere. But this is um, you know from 150 to 210 kilometers. Uh, and um, and so that would be I think more typical of what we would see with uh, with owls. And and the uh, wavelength here, the vertical wavelength. Uh, is about, if I recall, oh, it's about ten or ten or twenty kilometers. So. Other questions, and also from online, you can unmute and ask. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sorry if it, if it sounds silly. Uh, yeah. uh, this lidar instrument, like there is no imaging optics. There is just simple filter and. That's right. Filter. Yeah, but how is that resolution? come with the picture like uh um like is it like limiting the beam coming from so that no, that's uh yeah that's that's a great question so um so it is using uh uh so there are no imaging optics so we're measuring the full solar disk okay and so uh basically what we have to do is um forward forward model the setting of the solar disk in a set of reference atmospheres to forward model the absorbed extinction. Okay. okay. Um, and uh, but it, it, it there's a, a I guess a, a second answer to that, and that is um, on Proba two. There's a spacecraft called there's an instrument called Swap that is imaging. Okay. And so that's actually what this image is from. And we are working on occultations with Swap, but uh, but with the full disk photometers, you can also um, 
make the make the density measurements. But there are, there is a, a a relatively complicated retrieval that you have to do to account for the fact that it is a full disk measurement. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, so Ed, I missed the uh, geochrona part. Uh, so uh, you said, uh, what is the solar cycle, like uh, what is solar cycle variation of the geochrona? So what we're seeing in the in the uh, GOES data so far, as we've gone to this current solar cycle, is we're seeing maybe, uh, you know, 10, 15 percent enhancement um, at well, shown here at, at, at 3RE um, mm -hmm. uh, from solar minimum to, to solar maximum. Um, this is still an ongoing analysis. We actually can make measurements uh, up to about 5RE, so we can see how that changes. I just haven't, I haven't processed uh, the observations. We thought we saw a signature of a depletion at, at lower altitudes. Um, so at, on this figure around one, so, so actually you, you see it here, in this 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 green curve here, um, this is from 2023, and so we thought from 2022 to 2023 we saw this depletion. It went away in 2024. Uh, mm -hmm. If you if you look at emphasis, you do see a depletion with solar activity. So we weren't surprised to see that. Uh, maybe we we're a little more surprised to see that that depletion went away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, I know that in the thermosphere that there is less hydrogen uh, at solar maximum. So I was We're, just thinking, huh, yeah. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, it's it's still a work in progress. We thought we saw this depletion, kind of, uh, you know, in, in the in the in the thermosphere, but it didn't it didn't hold when we looked at the twenty twenty four data. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so for this, these observations here. Um, so I don't, I can't tell you the longitude off the top of my head. Uh, this was at dawn. Uh, uh, so um, because GOES is in a uh, geosynchronous orbit, it's always measuring at the same longitude. So the longitude is very well defined. I, I don't know. I don't know what it is, um, but we have the latitude here. And uh, actually, I did look into this. It, I believe it was um, somewhere between Iceland and uh, and the European continent, like somewhere out in the north, or the North Atlantic. Um, and then the width here of this packet, I believe, is something like six hundred kilometers. So the horizontal wavelength is actually quite quite large. And in terms of temperature, this would translate to about what 150 K, 100 150 K. Um don't I don't know actually. I'm not sure. Yeah. I uh, and the instrument is uh doesn't measure temperature at all. Yeah, yeah. So our our uh, our native uh measurement is um is density and we can derive a temp you know a temperature profile right. from the from the um uh density profile um but yeah i guess i guess we haven't we haven't done the temperature analysis on this so, <laughs> that would be yeah. interesting yeah the technical work awaitment what do you expect yeah, so from the theory, this is the typical vertical wavelength that in the thermosphere, uh, vertical wavelengths of 50, 100 kilometers are, are, are typical. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so is this, uh, so is on this slide is a gravity wave. So the, uh, the plot on the right, does that mean that the gravity wave started at higher altitude and then propagated to the lower altitude? I, I don't know. Yeah, that's that, that's that's a good question. It's it's something we're gonna uh, we're gonna uh, uh, look into. Um, I, I guess if it's aurora, aurorally generated, I, I think that would imply it's gonna uh, be formed at the altitude of, of peak uh, joule heating for that time. So mm -hmm. at least as a guess. And so what we wanted to do is actually use that, figure out what that altitude is, and then uh, and then draw. Uh, Use a geometric argument to figure out which um, uh, what whether it's upward propagating or downward propagating. Mm -hmm. 
anyone else the question so from online if not let's thank our speaker again thank you.